boy, and so people didn't really like him. So I was this little bookwormy kid and probably a bit of a smart aleck, so this is a recipe for disaster. Not that he told me much about it, but he was picked on, and so his social life was much less than my other two kids, and that's a typical nerd. This was when I was six, so the memories are a little fuzzy at this point. <laughs> um, but um, <clears throat> as I recall, uh, yeah, I, 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 I was grounded for some reason. I, didn't, I don't know why, but I think I felt that it was unjust. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and um, and I really wanted to go, go to my, this party, my cousin's party, uh, who was by you know, so this is a, a kid's party. But, um, so uh, I, 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 um, I, I, at first I was going to take my bike, uh, but then and I told my mom this, um, which is a mistake. Um, <laughs> and and, she, and she's, she told me some story about how you needed a license for a bike and the, and the police would stop me. So I wasn't 100% sure if, she was, if that was true or not, but I thought I'd better walk just in case. Um, so yeah, just, I, I, I sort of thought I knew the way, and, uh, but it was clear across town, so I don't know, it was 10 or 12 miles away, it's really, really quite far, um, further than I realized actually. And uh, so I just started walking to, to my cousin's house, I think it took me about four hours. And, um, and just as my mom was leaving that party with my brother and sister, she saw me walking down the road um, and freaked out. Um, and then I, and I, saw, I saw she saw me, so I, I, I then sprinted to my cousin's house, and I was just about two blocks away, and then climbed a tree and refused to come down. Like, I was trying to figure out when I was a kid, I had like this existential crisis and I was about 12 years old or something and and I was like, well, what does the world mean? What's it all about? Are we living some meaningless existence? So, uh, but then I read uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Douglas Adams, uh, which, was, which was like quite really quite a good book on philosophy, I think. And uh, I was like, okay, we don't really know what the answer is, obviously, uh, so, but the universe, the universe is the answer. And that really, what are the questions we should be asking to better understand the nature of the universe? So we should sort of take the set of actions that are most likely to result in us understanding what questions to ask about the nature of the universe. Um, so, the, so therefore, we, we, we must propagate uh, human civilization on Earth as far into the future as possible um, and become a multi-planet species to again extend the scope and scale of consciousness and incre increase the probable lifespan of, of um, consciousness, which is going to be, I think, probably a lot of machine consciousness as well in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that's the best we can do, basically. You know. And well, I think uh, generally, um, I've, a, lot, a lot of people that I admire in, in history, certainly um, scientists and engineers and sort of technologists in general. Obviously, I'm a big admirer of Tesla, Nikola mm -hmm. Tesla, um, and. Um, and, and you know many others. Uh, uh, I mean, all the obvious people that you can imagine. I'm saying, I, I like I like Tesla Edison too. Although people sometimes are surprised to hear that since we have a company called Tesla. Um, and uh, you know, Einstein, Newton, um, uh, just like Darwin, um, a big fan um, of, of Ben Franklin. I think he's just you know an awesome example of a great human being in history. You know, so that, I'd say that. Like that. And I admire anyone who's who's worked hard to accomplish some great thing. I mean, it's, it's worthy of admiration. So, um, you know, obviously, it's quite hard not to admire someone like Steve Jobs, uh, um, you know, or Bill Gates, or um, you know, in sort of present day, um, big fan of Larry Page, a good friend of mine. Is, uh, you know, what him and Sergey have done there is, is pretty awesome. But but I, I certainly was uh, quite. Um, I was very, very bookish. I was reading all the time. So I was either reading, uh, working on my computer, reading comics, playing Dungeons and Dragons, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, I guess when I was in the, around 12 or 13, I had kind of an existential crisis, and I was reading various books um, on trying to figure out the meaning of life and well, like what does it all mean? Because uh, it, it, it sort of seemed quite meaningless, and then. Um, 
uh, my, we happen to have like some, some books by Nietzsche and Schopenhauer in the house, which you should not read at age 14. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> it's really negative. Um, <laughs> so, so, uh, but, but then I, then I read uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which was like quite positive, I think, and, um, uh, and it sort of highlighted the, 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 an important point, which is that a lot of times the question is harder than the answer. And if you can properly phrase the question, then the answer is the easy part. Um, and so, uh, the, if, to the degree that we can um, better uh, understand the universe, then we know, better know what questions to ask. And um, then whatever the question is that most approx approximates what's the meaning of life, <laughs> you know, that, that, that's, that's the question we could ultimately get closer to understanding. Um, and so I thought, well, to the degree that we can expand the scope and scale of consciousness and knowledge, um, human knowledge, then that would be a good thing. As a kid, I just consumed like all science fiction and fantasy, you know, movies, books, anything at all, uh, even if it was like really schlocky. Uh, so, um, but in terms of, of sort of key influences, um, you know, like, I mean, I certainly like Star Trek because that actually shows like more of a utopian future like it's not like things like aren't horrible in the future like it was it's like there's so many bloody post-apocalyptic futures like okay can we have one that's nice just just a few <laughs> it's like um so i like, like like that about star trek um and uh you know in terms of some sort of uh key key books and movies i mean obviously star wars like star wars was the first movie i ever saw so obviously that's going to be fairly influential uh, it's like i never seen a movie in a theater before it was sort of like just <laughs> yeah, so it was like super great, um, and uh, yeah, and, and and then in terms of books, uh, I mean, Lord of the Rings is probably my favorite book. Um, it's, it's not really sci-fi. In fact, like oddly enough, like J.R.R. Tolkien was kind of anti-technology. Sci-fi and it's, fantasy are often like bedfellows. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is. But it, it, like, um, it's, uh, it's funny. Like Lord of the Rings is an awesome book, but it's kind of anti-technology. Um, it's still great. Um, and uh, uh, I think, like the Foundation series from Asimov, is like a really like one of the best ever. Um, and um, you know, the, the books, you know, Arthur C. Clarke and Heinlein, you know, those are like sort of the probably the three best sci-fi authors. Um. So you're a big science fiction fan, yeah. So I've got to ask you, what, what's your favourite fictional spacecraft? Ooh, fictional spacecraft. Um, well, you know, I'd have to say that would be. Um, one in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that's powered by the Improbability Drive. Fantastic! <laughs> I mean, that thing's awesome. <laughs> it does the most unexpected things. Right. So well, when I was in, in high school, I thought I'd most likely be doing physics at a particle accelerator. So that's what I was... Um, if physics and computer... I mean, I got distinctions in two areas, in physics and computer science, and those were, those were yeah, some of my two best subjects. And, uh, and then I thought, okay, well, that I want, I want to figure out what's the nature of the universe, and um, so I, you know, go try to work on with people banging particles together to see what happens. Leon came and told me that he wants to go to Canada. He really wanted to go to the United States. As a Canadian born, I could get my citizenship back, and then I could pass it on to my children. My best idea ever? Yeah. That's tricky. I, I suppose um, coming to North America was my best idea. Because I think these things would not have been accomplished, um, in a, you know, almost anywhere else. It's really hard to start a company, uh, but you know, and particularly California Silicon Valley is very conducive to startup. My, my, my mother was born in Canada, and actually, her, her father was uh, American, uh, but unfortunately, she didn't get her American citizenship. So then that broke the link, and I couldn't get my American citizenship. But she was born in Canada, so I could get. Uh, I actually filled out the forms for her and got her Canadian passport and me too. Um, and then as soon as, within three weeks of my getting my Canadian passport, I was in Canada. I get to go across the country for 100 bucks uh, and stop along the way and so um, I did what that and uh, just took a Greyhound across Canada and saw all these like little towns. Well, we were getting... <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't have much. I had like a backpack and a suitcase of books, 
But the, 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 that the bus company, the Greyhound, they unloaded it, uh, it in one of the cities and then the bus left without my, my stuff. Oh, that's nice. So I literally had nothing. All your books. But your clothes too? Um, actually, weirdly, I think I might have had the books. But not my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> my clothes. That was priorities. All you needed. Yeah, because I needed, I was just sitting in the bus station reading, waiting for the bus to get ready. Yeah. Um, and I think I had the books, but not, not, no, but no clothing. Oh no! <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, anyway, um, but I managed to get to Swift Current, Saskatchewan, um, and then my, my, but it, it's your cousin, cousin's son. Cousin's son, yeah, has an, a wheat farm there, and I worked on the wheat farm for about six weeks. Yeah, I was trying to figure out what, what, what I do next. Uh, I don't know what to do. Um, so then. But I ended up getting back on the bus and went to Vancouver. Mm. And I had a, a half uncle there um, who was kind of in the lumber industry. Um, he like made lumber, like lumber equipment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, basically. So I ended up chainsawing logs and working on uh, the slumber mill um, and uh, cleaning out the, 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 the where, they, where they boil the pulp and yeah. it's like mm. cra- crazy. Sort of boiler rooms. Yeah. Um, wow. You live on a buck a day. How did you, well, how do you briefly, live on a, Yeah, but how do you yeah. do that? I mean, there's several times in your life when you're basically well <laughs> below the poverty line, right? And this is yeah. one of them. Well, buck a day was, that was 20 years ago. Yeah. So, so was, that's like two bucks a day. Two bucks a day. Well, there's, uh, there's all the difference. <laughs> it is uh, all the difference. It does make a big difference. Um, yeah, well, I, I wasn't quite sure how much money, you know, uh, how, um, how hard it would be to get a job or so I, I hadn't really had a, a real job because um, I was only 17, so I'd done like paper routes and stuff like that. Um, so uh, I thought, well, just in case uh, it takes me a long time to get a job, I, I better make sure that my tiny stash of money uh, lasts a long time. So uh, I, had, I only had a few thousand dollars. Uh, so, um, so I thought, well, wait, let me see if I can live for under a buck a day. And you can do it. I mean, you just buy like hot dogs in bulk and oranges in bulk and you know, scur- scurvy is bad so you gotta have an orange, throw an orange in there. Yeah, so when, um, when the blisters start forming on your tongue it's time right. to get an orange. It, it'll, an orange every couple of days will, will you know, keep scurvy away. I was in Canada for, uh, for a few years at uh, Queen's University, got a scholarship to go down to uh, University of Pennsylvania because um, one of the downsides of, of coming to the University of North America was that uh, my, my parents said they would not, would not pay for college if it was well, my father said he would not pay for college unless it was in South Africa. So, so it was either so I could have free college in South Africa or, or find some way to pay it here. And uh, fortunately, I got a scholarship at, at the UK and, um, and so did uh, did EP, uh, business under, a dual undergraduate uh, business and business at UK. Our first venture together was running a kind of a nightclub ish. Really? Yeah. Is nightclub a euphemism? Uh, <laughs> no, it's really a nightclub. <laughs> um, yeah, well, we, 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 we had the same. Well, um, that, that's how we first met. We were actually just transfer uh, uh, students to UPenn and um, staying in, in like this the storm storm situation, which was uh, not not a lot of fun. Well, I, I was at I was at Penn, and um, there was a professor who um, who was chairman of a company in Silicon Valley that was working on advanced capacitors for use in electric cars, or potentially for use in electric cars. Uh, as it turns out, they're they're way too expensive. But um, but I thought, well, this is this is really awesome because then I asked if I could get a summer job because it was in Silicon Valley and working on technology for electric cars. I thought, well, that's that's pretty much as good as it gets. Um, so I got a summer job uh, here. I was in Las Gatas, actually. Um, and I'd worked at a company at called Pinnacle Research for a couple summers that did high-energy um, high density capacitors. I was going to try to do effectively like a solid-state version of, of what they were doing with um, uh, it's going to get very complicated from a technical standpoint, but they were using a ruthenium, ruthenium tantalum oxide. But ruthenium is extremely rare and expensive. It cannot scale that. So, it's like, can, can you find a substitute for ruthenium? But we were able to get to 
uh, energy density is comparable to lead-acid battery but with incredibly high power density. So, just well, I can go down a deep rabbit hole. No, I think with the advent of uh, high-energy lithium-ion batteries, a capacitor is not not the right path. We want to use um, advanced chip making equipment uh, to make capacitors that were precise at a molecular level. Um, so at the, you know, just a level of precision that, that was sort of unheard of in, in capacitors. Like capacitors, energy is a function of its area or, and, and the separation distance. So if you, have, if you can have very tiny separation distance um, and, you can, and you can inhibit quantum tunneling, like I said, how do you, things get pretty esoteric. <laughs> so you're going to inhibit quantum t tunneling, get a very short gap, um, um, and, and then you could, in theory, get to very high energy densities you, uh, um, by making capacitors in the way that you would make a, a, uh, an, an x86 processor. I think the, 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 the thought in 95 was that the internet was going to be something really that fundamentally changed humanity. It was like humanity acquiring a, a nervous system. I mean, when, when we first started out, I, I think our ambitions were really quite, quite low. Um, it was really to make enough money to pay the rent. Yeah, um, we, we, we got a VC so. to give us money. That was... Yay! Yeah. We, th we thought it was all over then. Yeah, it was pretty <laughs> crazy. I mean, when we started out at 95, we, we literally, at the beginning, we had one computer, which um, would be the web server during the day, and, and then at night, I'd program on it. <laughs> um, and, and we'd sleep in the office. Yeah, so we, we couldn't we, afford to, to yeah, have an we, apartment. It was cheaper to rent the office than to rent an apartment, so we just rented the office and slept in the office and showered at the showered YMCA. Showered at the YMCA. When and, we uh, went and talked to venture capitalists in uh, early 96, there was a much greater um, interest in what we were doing. Um, in fact, the round closed in like maybe a week or something. It was crazy. Yeah, we yeah. went from sleeping in the office to people throwing... I mean, again, this is a financial crowd, so you guys see these numbers every day, but for us to hear, we'll give you $3 million for... Yeah, it sounded extremely... We thought they were crazy. Like, I why mean, would they was, do that? Mm. It was literally like, <laughs> these people are insane. But they obviously do not realize we're sleeping in the office. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, when they, when they did fund us, yeah. they, they realized that we were illegal immigrants. Well, I mean, yes, we were. I'd say we were. it was a gray area. Yeah, yes, we were. I was, yeah, we were illegal immigrants. We were sleeping in the office. We didn't have a car. We had one car, but the wheel kept falling off. But, well, actually, yeah, the, the, the wheel did actually fall off the car. Yes, exactly. Uh, that, that's what led to the road trip to Stanford with uh, Robin Wren. Um, and, uh, and, and then I, that it was during that, that summer that I was, was like, okay, I, I can either spend several years kind of doing a PhD in, not that I care about the PhD actually, but I just needed a lab. Um, but I, I could either spend a bunch of years working in a lab, um, and maybe it would, maybe the technology would pan out, or maybe it wouldn't. Um, but the internet would, would was definitely about to go supernova in '95. So I was like, okay, look, I, I can always come back to working on electric cars, basically, um, and which of I did. <laughs> um, but the internet is not going to wait. So. It was, uh, so then I put um, Sanford on deferment and um, started Zip2, which was really just, uh, you know, we started off with maps and directions, yellow pages, white pages, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, it was, you know, for, for, best of my knowledge, the first maps and directions on the internet. So uh, and there's still some, like, patents I have. Uh, I don't know how many more, but I think they've obviously lapsed at this point, but um, for maps and directions and Yelp pages and advertising and stuff. And I, I wrote the whole the whole initial code base I wrote personally, because was, there wasn't any rails. It was just me. So, um, And I only had a few thousand dollars, and then my brother joined and he brought like five thousand dollars, which was a lot. Yeah, at least for the first few months, there was literally only one computer, so the website when the website wasn't working, it was because I was compiling code. <laughs> <laughs> and and, um, and even to get an internet connection was pretty hard, but there was an internet service provider on the floor below us. And we were more or less squatted in this office, 
Because the landlord was was like out of the country or something, and nobody was using it. <laughs> so, so, uh, but the first thing I, I tried to do was not to start a company. I tried to get a job at Netscape, but they didn't reply to me. Oh no! Oh, oh man! So I just and I tried and then I tried hanging out in the lobby at Netscape. <laughs> I don't know who to talk to. I was really too shy to talk to anyone. I don't know. So it's like, okay, I can't get a job at the only internet company that you know that that, that does internet software. So then I try writing software. Um, so that's um, kind of what kind of what happened there. Yeah, and then like I said, my brother came down and joined. This is like well, like late '95, um, and then in January '95, I think it was the. Um, uh, there was there was a lot more interest in the internet stuff, following Nets, the Netscape IPO, um, and the the software software was more impressive, I guess. So then we then more more David Allen invested. Um, so their VC firm on Sand Hill Road, um, and they they invested. I think it was like. Three million dollars for effectively sixty percent of the company. Wow. Um, which we thought was crazy. Uh, they're like, well, these give, they're going to give us the money for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and do research on um, electric vehicle tech technologies. That, that was my default plan. But but then I also thought that if I if I did a PhD at Stanford, then um, I could I would spend several years watching the internet go through this incredibly rapid growth phase and that would be really difficult to, to handle. Like it's like you really wanted to be doing something. So, so, um, so Zip2 started off um, as basically, uh, like I said, we're trying to figure out how to, how to make enough money to exist as a company. And the, so, so since there wasn't really any advertising money being made, uh, we thought we could um, help existing companies get online, bring their stuff online. So we, we developed software that helped bring um, a lot of the newspapers and media companies online, because a lot of them just didn't, they also didn't know what the internet was. Um, with, with X, the thought was to create an uh, integrated set of financial services, um, so that you could go to one place and do all of your financial anything. Um, and, and then as a feature, we had the ability to transfer money or securities or anything simply by entering, entering a unique identifier. So like a, you know email address or phone number or something. Um, and uh, when we demo the system, the hard stuff, which was the integration of all the financial services, uh, people would not be interested in, but they'd be really interested in, it, in being able to transfer money using an email address. So that was actually quite easy. Um, and so we focused our, our energy on that. Um, and although it's easy in principle, it, uh, what gets really hard is, is adding um, security while still keeping it easy to use. We, we lived in a little office, I think this address was 470 Sherman Way in uh, yeah. in Palo Alto. It was probably... It was about the size of this room here. Wow. Yeah, it was probably like 15 feet wide by 30 feet long with a little little closet in the back. And we would, um, we, we, did, we couldn't afford a place to sleep, or like a, like a house, a home or apartment. So we would sleep in it, and it had a couch that was a futon, and we would pull out the futon, take turns sleeping on the futon or the floor. Although he coded a lot at wow. night, so I usually got the futon at night. <laughs> nice. um, uh, and we had, we had to code it at night because the server, when the internet was live, needed to be functional. And we just had data for the Bay Area at the time, so we were just kind of making sure that the people in the Bay Area could use it. And then um, uh, and then we, I had a little, little mini fridge with a cooking stove on it, and we'd cook uh, simple things, you know, like pasta sauce and pasta and things like that. that would be as cheap as dirt. People think you, it's expensive to eat real food. It's actually really cheap. Yeah. You know, you cook, cook some vegetables, pasta, and beans and stuff. Beans, super cheap. So we had that Jack <laughs> in the Box. It's absolutely the cheapest. <laughs> and, then, and then we would go eat at Jack in the Box, which I can still, I still kind of shiver a little. <laughs> and I still, I've eaten there for, for probably 20 years uh, or longer, maybe 22 years. And I can still probably recite the entire menu. Yeah, we cycled through the menu at Jack in the Box because it's walking, it was like a few blocks away from. And it was open 24 hours. Open 24 hours. Yeah. Trying to get to, you know, dinner at Palo Alto after 10 is a very different. Zero. Yeah. yeah. So did they know you very well at, at Jack in the Box? Well, they didn't really. No. They didn't? <laughs> no. And I remember one time I got a milkshake and, and I, I was so tired. It was like four, 4 in the morning and just needed to get some sugar for the, for the rest of the night. And, and there was something in it. 
Oh, no. And I remember just flicking it out and just pretending it didn't exist and just <laughs> kept drinking my milkshake. Oh, <laughs> oh that's it was, it was like that, or that kind of like not in the zone to go back into Jack and the Box <laughs> argue about a milkshake, but I don't want to not drink the milkshake. And part of the reason that food was like so cheap is that they had uh, some people I think died of food poisoning. Yes, of course. Uh, yes. And, like, it was it, right around that time when they got a, into a food poisoning scare. Oh, and the, <laughs> yeah, so they're. they're it was just very cheap to eat there. <laughs> and I figured, like, you know, they're probably, have, you know, have taken some action because after the food poisoning, yeah, so they did. hopefully. Yeah, that's all. Maybe it's just like eat a little bit of it. Yeah, does it yeah, taste yeah. funny? I need to stop eating if it tastes funny. <laughs> you run out of things to eat because it, after, like, the 17th chicken fajita pita, you're like, mm. chicken you fajita pita? Can't do it. The teriyaki bowl. Yeah, remember that teriyaki bowl? Was that one good? It's, it's actually it varied, but it was it was edible. It was so bad. Which one was? The teriyaki bowl. Teriyaki bowl wasn't bad. There was the sort of uh, sourdough uh, grilled grilled cheese thing that was wasn't bad. Yeah, I don't see the reminder. Those were the good old days, right? I mean, it was honestly it was good days. I mean, we just we were just hoping that people would let us stay in the country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't really that worried about what we were eating. We, we, were, we were just doing everything we could to, uh, to, get, to, to get someone to support the company. We didn't really understand, I didn't understand the venture capital world that much, so we were doing a seed round, an angel round, and doing our best to talk to everyone and anyone we could find. Uh, we had a very good friend with us, Greg Curry, who's now passed away, who was older than us by about 10 years, I think. And, yeah. Uh, was a wonderful mentor, helped us out and uh, put a little money in as well. And and then uh, I did a lot of the work to just find, just network with people. I think our uh, with our first salesman who was selling Yellow Pages ads for us uh, was a real estate agent who knew another person who knew this other person who helped us who helped us in raise or put together. We ended up not doing the round, but put together a, a round of like. Two hundred thousand dollars or something. Yeah, and then um, we did like part of it or something. I don't yeah, know. but I think once we had the Java Java map, which was really quite impressive. I mean, if you've never seen, if you're if you've never seen Google Maps or Yahoo Maps before, it really is a remarkable thing to see. We we started to go to uh, we got it we got some audiences with some venture capitalists, and it just went from we were starving. We had no car. Well, the car we had had broken. The wheel yeah. fell off. Huh? The wheel oh, fell off. Yeah. The wheel fell off, yeah. What kind of car was it? I remember that. It's an old BMW 3 Series. Was it the one you worked we on? we did a road nice. yeah. across oh, the country. Great. Yeah, my, the one that my mom has some pictures of. I think there's, I think there's still a, a, there's a, there's a carve in the, t in the road at Page Mill and Al Camino. It literally, the wheel came off. The wheel fell off and, and, the, and the guy. Literally in the intersection. Just drove it without the wheel <laughs> to, the, to the side. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty much time for the junkyard at that point. Because it, the whole car is falling apart. So, uh, yeah, it's like the point at which the wheel falls off. It's time to go to the junkyard. <laughs> the goal with in doing my second area company was to, to create something that would have a profound effect. And it seems to me that the financial sector had not seen um, a lot of innovation on the internet. And, and money is really just an entry in a database. Um, and and it's, so it's low bandwidth. It's, it seems like it's something that should lend itself. Advice and whatnot. But uh, in December, well, late, late December 2000, which went on a trip to South Africa, came back January, early, early January 2001, and I had a severe case of malaria, almost died. This brilliant idea to start a video arcade, because um, we really knew what games were popular. Yeah. So a year before, this is 94, we took, Elon was working at some video game company, and uh, there's a theme here. What? Yeah. <laughs> I was actually working, I was doing two jobs. Uh, one was at a video company, a video game company that was ironically called Rocket Science. Um, <laughs> and, and then working on ultra, um, ultra capacitors during the day for electric cars. With, uh, um, I mean, as mentioned, I was quite interested in electric cars from when I was doing my undergrad physics. And um, in fact, I originally came out to California to do PhD at Stanford in applied physics material science to work on ultra capacitors and electric cars. Um, so it was a, a long-standing interest of mine, and um, and the internet kind of put that on hold for a few few years. But then once after PayPal, I, I decided I wanted to get back into 
um, electric vehicles and um, uh, in, in, in a while, but the, I do actually still own one gasoline car, which is uh, a 67 Series 1 E-Type Jag. Hi, Elon Musk speaking. It's 7 o'clock in the morning, and Elon Musk anxiously waits for his golden payoff, his prize for paying his dues in the valley. I expect to receive uh, a car that I've just bought, which is called the McLaren F1. It's a million dollars for a car. It's... It's, uh, it's decadent. There are 62 McLarens in the world, and I will own one of them. Back in 95, there weren't very many people on the Internet, um, and certainly nobody was making any money at all. Uh, most people thought the Internet was going to be a fad. Not this South African entrepreneur. Musk sold his first computer program at the age of 12, and he hasn't stopped selling since. Wow, I can't believe it's actually here. It's pretty wild, man. Just three years ago, I was showering in the, at the Y and sleeping on the office floor. And now, obviously, I've got a million-dollar car and quite a few creature comforts. It's just a moment in my life. Receiving cash is cash. I mean, those are just a large number of Ben Franklins. It's the perfect car for Silicon Valley. It really is. There is, gentlemen, the fastest car in the world. I could go and buy one of the islands in the Bahamas uh, and turn it into my you know, personal fiefdom. Wow. I'm much more interested in trying to uh, build and create a new company. So this is an ATM. What we're going to do is transform the traditional banking industry. Yeah, I do not fit the picture of a banker. I think X.com could absolutely be a, a multi-billion dollar bonanza. So you wreck the car, you get out of the car, you're doubling over with laughter. <laughs> and the really? person with you said, why are you laughing that you just wrecked this car? And you said, no, you don't know the funny part. It wasn't insured. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the punchline's correct. I, I think the, the, the thing that uh, drives me is that uh, I want to be able to think about the future and uh, you know, feel good about that. Uh, so uh, that uh, you know, we're doing what we can to uh, have the future be, be as good as possible. To be inspired by what is likely to happen um, and to look forward to the next day. Um, so that's that's what really what really drives me is, is, is trying to figure out uh, how do we how to make sure that things are great and how uh, going to be so and um, that's the underlying principle behind uh, Tesla and SpaceX. Um, and, um, uh, and I mean, I, I think these, there's, there's some things that are important for the future: sustainable energy, obviously, sustainable transport, um, ultimately, ultimately becoming a multi-planet species, and um, and traveling out there among the stars. I think those are those are great things. Those are the things that make me like the future and will be inspired about the future. Um, whereas if those things don't happen, the future I think looks quite dim. Um, and um, and I, I, mean, I just feel quite fortunate that we've made the progress that we have on, on those fronts and uh, we'll aspire to make more progress in the future. Uh, but you know, in terms of things that I think are most likely to affect the, the future of humanity, I think um, AI is probably the single biggest item in the near term that's likely to affect uh, humanity. So it's very important that we have the advent of AI uh, in a good way, that, that uh, is something that um, if, you, if you could look into the crystal ball and, and see the future, you would, li you would like that outcome. Um, uh, genetics it might be the sort of second most important item. I, I think um, having a high bandwidth interface to the, the brain, like um, we're currently bandwidth limited. We, we, we have a digital tertiary self. Uh, in the form of our email capabilities, our computers, phones, applications, uh, we're effectively superhuman. Uh, but we are extremely bad with constraint in that interface between the cortex and your sort of uh, that, that tertiary digital form of yourself. And um, helping solve that uh, bandwidth constraint uh, would, would be, I think, very important. Let's see. So, I'm mean, I'm totally, uh, Kimball, uh, thanks for coming on. Um, about the things that I thought would be most important to work on for a long time, all the way back to college days. Um, and um, electric cars are something I've been interested in since I was like, I don't know, 18, 19. Um, 
Yeah. When do you first recall hearing me talk about electric cars? Just curious. First time was well, you, you talked about it in the '90s a lot. Uh, we we we, had, we used to brainstorm a lot randomly, even in I think we were 20 20 years old. And the first thing I remember us brainstorming was solving connectivity amongst doctors. Huh. And we were on a road trip from. That was hopeless. Huh? <laughs> Long time ago, we had a lot of doctors in the family, so we had the information. But the idea was really to solve that problem where we are from Silicon Valley to Philadelphia, brainstorming how you do it. This is before the internet, so we. we our minds designing network computers, doctors talking. This has all happened, of course, over 25 years, but it's one of the, it's one of the, it's sort of the first time I remember us really trying to solve a world problem, and unless it was a world problem that was really important, it just wasn't that interesting to us. Electric cars, uh, you talked about for a long time, but um, I remember walking into your house once, it says in probably 2002 or 2003, and you had these plans laid out that uh, the team at Tesla had. Well, the, the earlier guys had, had basically said, you know, we're going to take this Lotus Elise, we're going to convert it into an electric car. And, you know, we sat down and talked about it for a bit, and, and it wasn't so much that it, um, it could be done. I think we all believe it could be done. It was more just the attitude that it should be done. So with, with X.com, which uh, became PayPal, uh, that's, where, that, that's where we tried to do some things with the, with the Internet. Um, and it got sort of part of the way towards its, its objective. Um, after PayPal um, uh, went, went public and, and then got bought by eBay in 2002, uh, that actually freed up uh, me and a bun bunch of other people to go and create companies. And I started debating between either solar, electric car, or space. Um, I thought space was like the least likely to have somebody, the least likely to attract um, entrepreneurial talent. I thought like, like nobody is going to be crazy enough to do space, so I better do space. Um, so I started off with, with space first. Um, and, um, and then about a year and a half later in 2003, uh, I had lunch with uh, J.B. Straubel and Harold Rosen. And um, it was that... Uh, it's like fish restaurant in El Segundo. Um, and Hal Rosen uh, had been involved in space and electric vehicles. Um, and, um, and JB was, had just, got, just graduated from college and was working with him. And the conversation turned to electric vehicles um, because uh, Harold had done something called Rosen Motors, which was like an attempted EV startup. And I said, well, I've always been super interested in electric vehicles. I was going to do my PhD on um, advanced energy, energy storage. <coughs> Sorry. I was going to do grad studies on on advanced energy storage techniques for electric vehicles. And um, and so JB said, well, have you heard of this company called AC Propulsion? Because uh, they had created um, it, the T0 electric sports car as a prototype. Um, I was like, wow, that's great. Uh, like lithium-ion batteries had really achieved a level of energy density that um, for the first time could allow you to have significant range in, in an electric car. The, the idea of, of like lying on a beach as my main thing uh, just sounds like the worst, that sounds horrible to me. Mm -hmm. uh, just because the boredom factor. I would go bonkers. I would, mm -hmm. you know. Um, What's next, you suppose? We've gone from, we've gone from newspapers and $3.825 million uh, dollar, uh, checks, we've gone to PayPal, we've gone to uh, Tesla, we've gone to SpaceX. He wants to save the world. He's a, he's a, he's a crusader, him and Kimball. Yes, Kimball especially, that's another issue. But as far as Elon's concerned, I worry, you know, because what now? What else is there? I mean, I start worrying that he, he, he bored him, you know, that, that he might suddenly get bored just sending stuff up to NAF or NASA every week or two weeks I mean mm. you know this is this is becoming passe passe you know yeah so that worries me about Elon because uh, why if he, he's one of those people he certainly was as a boy if he suddenly decides it's not interesting anymore he just sort of drops it yeah but I doubt he'll do that but I'm just saying it worries me I, I hope he finds something that keeps him you know sort of worrying about something maybe as long as he's got something to worry maybe about maybe he'll crack time travel who knows I mean that, that, could, that, yeah. could, that could be the next